We will now inquire further and dig into questions which hit the nerve and sometimes can be a bit hurting. Because yes, the lack of diversity is very often talking about what happens in Hollywood, but the lack of diversity in the documentary world is actually less talked about. And very often we have, well, white, cis, male documentary filmmakers telling stories about, well, other people, interesting others. So um, POCs, LGBTIQs, women, filmmakers with other special abilities who are not maybe getting enough support from broadcasters, funders, institutions to tell their own stories. What do we do? Because in doc documentary filmmaking, the question of who gets behind the camera is of critical importance. So we want to interrogate now our respective insider outsider perspective and uh, see how can we center marginalized storytellers and protagonists in the following uh, session inside outside storytelling gaze and power in documentary filmmaking And I take the opportunity that uh, Usman is on its way, I think, from Mali to join us uh, to give you a couple of more words of information about this session coming up. So we will have the producer, Signe Berger Sorensen. Uh, you might know President, we had this uh, a, a case she produced it from Camilla Nielsen, we had the talk two days ago, uh, but also she is a producer of um, uh, the Joshua Oppenheimer, you know The Act of Killing, The Look of Silence, excellent films. We will have also with us Nefise Oscar Lorenzen, uh, who is uh, also in our AMA session a little bit later on for her film Seran Atesh, Sex, Revolution and Islam, which will be our case study, which is also running here. And we will have Usman Samaseku, um, who is presenting here The Last Shelter at the CPH, CP, CPH Docs Film Festival. Who? Bear with me. It is day three. I have told this probably a couple of times. And the discussion will be uh, led and moderated by B. Ruby Rich, who I had the honor and pleasure to hear uh, in New York speaking herself as a keynote speaker, but who is absolutely a fantastic moderator. She's the editor of Film Quart Quarterly since 2013. And she's Professor Emerita in Documentary at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and the author of two books, New Queer Cinema and the Feminist Film Movement. So I think we have an excellent uh, uh, panel here and I'm very glad that um, I am part of it because I'm going to translate for Usman. Is Usman here now? I just... He's there. This is fantastic. So we're ready to go. Let's go. I'm here. Hello, everyone. Hello. Wonderful. Hello. Okay. We're live. Thank you so much. Um, thanks to uh, AC Coppins, uh, the curator for this industry conference, and to Anna Krastev Kovacs and their team for bringing us all together and managing this uh, not so simple technology. So here we go. Um, I am B. Ruby Rich, as explained. I am an academic escapee. I left the university last year. And um, I am still editing the journal, and I'm speaking to you now um, from my temporary home in Paris. Uh, I'm thrilled to be joined by uh, Signe Ber uh who has made so many incredible films, uh, The Act of Killing and The Look of Silence, as you heard, but also this year alone, President and Flea, both amazing films. And in the festival, Our Memory Belongs to Us will be premiering, where she is credited as producer, but also as co-director. Uh, Nafise Oscar Lorenzen, um, you know, is here, as just stated, um, with Serenata's Sex, Revolution, and Islam, but has also made this remarkable trilogy 
of films, uh, Gender Me, uh, Balloon for Allah, and Man Islam, uh, bringing uh, new stories into public visibility. Welcome, um, Nafise. And of course, as we've heard um, most wonderfully, joining us from Bamako, Mali, uh, we have Usman Samaseku, who is here yeah. with, um, welcome here, Usman, with The Last thank you, Shelter. Thank you very much, yeah. Yes, and a documentary you, about life at Carita's house, right, of migrants on the edge of the Sahel Desert in Mali. So welcome all three of you. Uh, you all have uh, films in the festival. Um, I think they are amazing films. And we're going to start by taking up um, these questions of representation, as AC has suggested. Um, uh, are you going to stay with us, AC, through this? Because you're going to translate for Usman, is that right? Very yes. good. So um, uh, we are reconfigured as with three people on the panel, and we're going to talk. Uh, start. Um, I want to ask you all to start by talking about why you have brought this film to us. Why this film? Uh, why this issue? Um, how did you arrive at this? And um, can I start with you, Senior? Can I do that? Um, put you on the spot. <laughs> No, sure. But uh, which film do you want me to and, talk about? Um, I, I would love, for, I know you have so many, but I would love for you to talk right this moment about Our Memory Belongs to Us. I'm going to start with each one with sure. a specific, and then we'll go a little bit broader into what led you in to documentary filmmaking. But just to start with sure. this, um, um, I would love to hear um, how you um, uh, got in touch with Rami Farah and how you became involved in bringing us this film. Well, basically, Rami Farah and his producer in France, uh, Liana Sally, they got in touch with me at ITFA through an organization called International Media Support. And uh, Rami is a Syrian himself and a refugee. Um, and he had this hard disk with material from Dara um, in Syria from the first early days of the revolution. And he came to Copenhagen later and showed this material to me and an editor called Janus Bilsko Jensen. And we, I mean, we were very, very intrigued, but we also realized while watching this that there was so much we didn't understand. And we realized that we only started really to understand when uh, Rami and Diana were giving us the context. So it was down to every clip. We had so many questions and we, we, uh, started this conversation that then actually went on for years where my role was basically to be the outsider and ask all the stupid questions and and uh, and really try to understand what was going on and their role were as the insiders trying to explain to me what they saw and what it was that I I didn't get and therefore we also together realized that we needed that context in into the material and as time went went by we also wanted to have the the, the characters who shot the material these uh, citizen journalists in dara to tell their own story and to reflect upon the old their own material later on because the war went went on and on and we realized that there could be something strong in letting them talk about what initially had, had led to the revolution and their very first experiencing of becoming citizen journalist, but also what they saw and what it has meant for them later on. So in that sense, this film has maybe at least three gazes some, somewhere there. There's the gaze of the citizen journalist looking at their own material. There's Rami looking at them and talking to them as, as an outsider, insider, and then there's me from the afar asking questions and trying to understand what is really going on in Dara at the time and with these uh, citizen journalists right now. Very good. Thank you, Sine. Um I've had the, the privilege to see all of these films, so I can tell you this is a remarkable collection. I really congratulate um, uh, the curators. Uh, for this. Um, uh, Nafisa, can I ask you the same thing, like how you got to know uh, Seranates and how you approached uh, the subject of covering um, her interventions into society and what she faces and 
how 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 did this project come to you? How did you decide to intervene in this way to bring us this story about a, a woman imam who is very uh, rule breaking uh, for an, in an Islamic context? Thank you. Sure. Uh, before uh, before how I met Sayran, I should say that uh, I uh, made a trilogy about Islam and gender. So gender and religion. Um, kind of my uh, key concept in my quest uh, in this uh, world of documentary filmmaking. So I always have this gender baggage with me. Um, after I finished making my trilogy, so I have I decided to make a film about uh, female imams all around the world. Uh, so I had started to make interviews. So at that time, Seyran didn't open her mosque because I, I started this project 2015. And uh, so my mother always, you know, uh, helps me and she reads lots of articles and she always bring articles to me and read this, you know, that if you want to make a good film, you have to read this type of thing. So one day she, she gave me an article about Seyran Atesh. At that time, I didn't know her. So I read the article and I said, oh my God, I, I, I mean, how is, how is it possible that I didn't know her? So, uh, so I just, you know, uh, traveled to uh, Berlin together, together with my uh, cinematographer, Anders Schoft, and we started to film her. And then I decided that I'm not going to make a film about, in general, uh, uh, the, um, the female imams in the world, but I'm going to concentrate on Seyran Atesh. And as an artist, I have been curious about searching what is hidden behind the reality and how uh, reality is interpreted. Because, you know, Seyran's reality from our perspective is like she is highly protected, she's police protected, and it is not easy to, you know, enter into her life. So I was kind of, you know, curious, how can I enter in her life and how, how can I show her life to the, uh, to the audience? So that was my inspiration. So when I uh, started to work with uh, uh, Seyran Atesh, so I really see this mm, wonderful person, wonderful human being uh, who, who really inspired me. And I wanted to make this film not about this unreachable uh, women who are police protected, but I wanted to make a film about the sister, uh, the mother, uh, the neighbor, Seyran Atesh. Very good. Very good. Thank you for that. Uh, Usman, I am coming to you and uh, I know you'll be answering in French. And thank you, AC, in advance for the translation. So let me ask you, Usman, uh, you have made this beautiful film, uh, The Last Shelter, where you uh, got the trust of people in a very precarious situation. And I wonder, how did you choose this shelter as a place to film? And how did you get permission to enter their world and to bring us inside? How were you able to do this? Uh, en fait, uh, l'idée de faire en fait un film uh, sur uh, l'immigration uh, me hantait depuis uh, que j'ai commencé à faire le cinéma. Et je me demandais comment traiter le sujet, en fait. Et l'idée de filmer également euh, dans cette maison de migrants qui est un refuge m'est arrivée en 2018 lors euh, d'un atelier euh, sur l'immigration qui regroupait euh, également des spécialistes de l'immigration, mais aussi, en fait, euh, euh, des réalisateurs et producteurs organisés par STEP, euh, 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 de la Sud-Afrique. Donc, c'est comme ça que j'ai pris connaissance, en fait, de ce lieu, de cette maison de migrants qui se trouve au Mali, chez moi, à Gao. Et c'est ainsi que j'ai décidé de m'y rendre et de voir euh, comment je pourrais documenter euh, tout ce qui se passe euh, euh, dans cet endroit, en fait. Yeah. Okay, so um, I had this idea to do something about immigration since I actually started with cinema. And uh, this subject, uh, which uh, actually drew me to the uh, home of migration, was in 2018 uh, during a workshop for specialists of immigration by STEP, uh, where, where, where there were also directors and producers, if I understood it right. So this is why I decided to go there um, to Gao in Mali and uh, have a look at that house.
Yes. Very Et, good. Uh, go on. Uh, quand je suis arrivé dans cet espace, en fait, uh, ce qui m'a le plus en fait uh, frappé, c'est que cet endroit m'a un peu replongé en fait uh, dans une histoire uh, très intime, qui est l'histoire de ma famille, l'histoire de mon oncle qui est parti. Ça fait 32 ans, dont on n'a plus uh, ses nouvelles. On ne sait pas s'il est vivant ou il est mort. Et j'ai rencontré en fait dans ce lieu une dame qui s'appelle Natacha dont j'avais déjà entendu parler euh, lors de l'atelier. Et ça fait plus de cinq ans qu'elle est dans ces lieux, dans ces refuges. Elle ne se rappelle plus, en fait, d'où elle vient, ni comment retourner, en fait, chez elle. Et cela m'a un peu plongé dans l'histoire de mon oncle. Et je me suis dit, en fait, que c'est une histoire, en fait, qui est générale. C'est une histoire qui, qui touche, en fait, euh, presque de nombreuses familles euh, euh, en Afrique de nombreuses familles qui ont vu en fait leurs enfants partir, surtout avec le soutien de la famille, parce que en Afrique, quoi qu'on dise, l'immigration reste un projet de famille en fait. Um, as I was uh, pl the, the, the going to this house has plunged me actually in the intimate story of my family because my uncle uh, has actually disappeared for 32 years now and we don't even know if he's living or dead and Natasha who is living in the house for more than five years she doesn't even know where she comes from she cannot remember and this kind of stories is a story which is touching a lot of families of Africa where a lot of kids have been living already. And uh, this is actually the core of the uh, migration stories in, 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 Af in Africa. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Fascinating. Um, I, want, I want to ask you, if I can, all, all three of you, um, how do you see these issues being represented in the world? You know, you were drawn to tell these stories. And I wonder, do you see yourselves as an insider or an outsider? Um, were there kinds of representations of these issues of refugees, of, of women in Islam, of the war in Syria, the revolution in Syria, uh, the question of African migration? Were there representations out there that you really are trying to combat, to fight against? Um, or was there an absence of representation that you wanted to fill? Um, I know I am throwing some new questions at you today uh, beyond our planning, but I think I feel so moved by having seen your films now that I want to dig a little more deeply into this. So what is your thinking? I, I, how we, we need your films, I believe. We need your documentaries. But how do you feel? Um, what was it? Representation, misrepresentation, absence that brought you to this. And um, I think I will start with you, Nafise. Let me start with you. And then I'll come to you, Usman, and then I'll end uh, with you, Sinye. So. Um, <clears throat> Actually, uh, you know, the word uh, diversity and representation, we have been using it all the time. So whenever you just look at the um, some, you know, the network of some institution, they're always saying that, yeah, we are going to represent the minorities and diversity is very important for us and all this stuff. So I see, you know, when I read these uh, texts, so I just always remember the taxi driver that uh, I, I used to meet in, in Turkey. Uh, so he was a really really great guy but you know he really didn't like the new rules that you have to use the seat belts so uh so he 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 was driving but he wasn't he was kind of you know using his seat belt but not you know putting inside so i see like the institutions right now so they are talking about this representation and diversity but they are not really implementing it they are just pretending like the taxi drivers in Turkey. So the question is how we can, in a way, create the consciousness that the institutions will take it, you know, in their in their heart. I mean, they, they will say that it is necessary. It is like, you know, uh, drinking water or whatever, eating bread. We need these representations. Otherwise, you know, we can't really survive. I mean, our souls will be so... Uh, uh, yeah, boring. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I feel like, you know, I think as, as, an, as, as artists, so we should really uh, 
fight for it and we should really make it uh, very visible and we should not like you know whenever you, we get fin finance uh, from some you know institutions we should not just say that okay now i'm safe i don't need to talk about it we have to talk about it because uh, because the uh, diversity issues and uh, and inclusion and exclusion issues are not implemented and uh, so it is we have lots of work to do, I guess. Great. I love this example of the fake seatbelt. I'm going to remember that. Uh, Usman, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, you can translate for me uh, uh, this question, please. I forget uh, the question. Je vais le faire pour yeah, vous, Usman, il n'y a pas de problème. Voilà, voilà. Bien sûr, pas de problème. Comment les histoires que tu vois dans le monde, dans le film de la télévision, les histoires que, que, que vous, vous racontez tous, dont vous parlez aujourd'hui, sont représentées dans le monde Est-ce que tu te considères comme un insider ou un outsider Est-ce que tu as envie de combattre ce que tu vois quand tu vois ces histoires d'inclusion, etc., où tu te dis est-ce que c'est authentique ou pas authentique C'est un petit peu ça la question. Et, et... Exactement, en fait, ce qui m'a donné plus envie de faire du documentaire, c'est exactement ça. C'est de pouvoir dénoncer, en fait, euh, les choses qui, qui sont presque taboues dans nos sociétés, en fait. En Afrique, il y a beaucoup de sujets, en fait, qui sont intouchables, dont on ne peut pas parler euh, quand il s'agit de la politique, quand il s'agit de la corruption, quand il s'agit de l'égalité euh, euh, des chances, de, dans l'égalité des droits également, quand il s'agit de l'immigration. Quand il s'agit de surtout la famille également, ça devient quelque chose de très fermé, très tabou. Et moi, que ce soit mon premier documentaire, Les héritiers de la colline, qui parle d'un système gangréné politique qui s'est mis, s'est vu au Mali depuis dans les années 90, et aussi euh, euh, le dernier refuge euh, qui parle de l'immigration comme, c'est-à-dire un fléau plus familial qu'individuel en fait. Donc, pour moi, il faut dénoncer en fait ce qui ne va pas, c'est ce qui m'a donné envie de faire ce métier. Et le documentaire, il est tellement réel et moi j'aime tellement filmer ce qui est vivant, ce qui est réel, ce qui est direct. Je fais du cinéma direct, donc ça raconte en fait la réalité des choses et ça permet également à beaucoup de gens de, de voir ce qu'ils entendent parce que il y a beaucoup de choses qui se racontent autour de l'immigration, mais quand on le voit, c'est encore plus choquant. Et ça nous permet d'avoir une forme de sensibilisation, euh, des changements des mentalités, des conceptions également euh, et voilà, euh, sur l'immigration. Parce que beaucoup de ceux qui partent ne savent pas en fait euh, réellement, ils sont soit mal informés ou ne sont pas informés en fait de ce qui les attend. En fait. yeah. Donc, euh, je pense que euh, faire des films dans ce sens permet aux gens de yeah. mieux euh, voilà, appréhender yes. euh, la situation. I, I need to do it now because although it's too long. <laughs> so this is exactly what brought me actually to film. This is what I really wanted to do and um, uh, to, to bring it uh, uh, on screen because there are so many stories which are taboo in our societies and uh, politics, corruption, uh, questions of equality, um, uh, stories around the families. And this is what also I took in my first documentary. And also the, this documentary is more about families rather than an individual story. So I, the way I film is um, I want to film what is lively directly. I want to film the reality of things and I want people to see what they hear. I want people uh, hear, sorry. I want also to be able to change their conceptions, for example, on immigration, because until now they have been really badly informed. Very good. Usman, I don't think you were finished. Do you want to continue with your thought? Yeah. Et je pense que en fait ça les documentaires en fait permettent toujours en fait à une population c'est ça permet de entre guillemets rééduquer en fait les mentalités en fait parce que il euh, y a des sujets en fait dont tout le monde sait mais personne ne vit touché en fait et quand tu arrives à exprimer cela dans un film et à faire une diffusion également large en fait euh, de ce film dans les points les plus reculés en fait euh, euh, de ton pays ou de l'Afrique dans les villages et autres et dans des communautés, ça permet aux communautés de prendre conscience, ça permet aux familles. Moi, je sais que ce film, si on arrive à le faire euh, diffuser en, en large, un peu partout au Mali, 
il y a beaucoup de familles, il y a beaucoup de parents qui vont se questionner en fait euh, sur le départ de leur enfant, sur l'absence de leur enfant et, et aussi à se poser la question, est-ce que ça vaut vraiment la peine en fait que euh, on puisse euh, sacrifier euh, jusqu'au sacrifice ultime qui est notre vie à vouloir chercher euh, de quoi euh, subvenir aux besoins de la famille. Au-delà de ça, c'est aussi une question en plus euh, politique. Je pense que ce qui pousse en fait les gens à partir, c'est vraiment en fait euh, euh, un manque de volonté politique de nos dirigeants qui ne mettent pas les moyens en place pour que les gens puissent et ne pas vouloir partir en fait. Et que ce soit euh, euh, mettre en place euh, des vraies politiques euh, euh, d'embauche des jeunes, des vraies politiques d'éducation des jeunes, des de vraies politiques d'égalité des chances euh, au niveau euh, euh, de l'emploi. Je pense que c'est ce qui fait que beaucoup de gens partent parce que quand ça ne va pas, euh, l'homme, et selon l'éducation qu'on a tous reçue, c'est à l'enfant d'aller chercher pour souvenir aux besoins de sa famille. Et partir en Afrique en aventure, c est, c est, c est, on ne voit pas le plus souvent cela comme plus un sacrifice, c'est même plus euh, une chance d'oser aller affronter le désert et la mer pour pouvoir subvenir aux besoins de sa famille. Et dans l'inconscience, dans nos inconscients, on s'est dit même si on meurt en faisant cela, on meurt avec la baraka et c'est sûr que Dieu va nous accueillir dans son paradis. Donc, euh, euh, c'est tout cela qu'il faut déconstruire, en fait. Mm -hmm. Ah, ils ont coupé le courant chez moi. Je suis oh, désolée. Il y a l'obscurité. Tu es toujours dans l'audio, tu es toujours dans l'audio. Donc, je vais vite euh, traduire. Ah, ouf, <rire> Euh, ne pars pas, reste avec nous. <rire> On te voit encore un peu. Alors, um, le do documentary, yes, documentary is really a way to change the mentalities because we, there are things we do not know, but um, we cannot really touch it. So when we have the chance to have documentaries which are able to have a much larger distribution, we can reach maybe to far away villages, far away communities, and we can make them what is happening in their families and what happens to their kids so that they can question this and question this absence and questions is it worth to sacrifice your kid because uh, it, it is very often seen as a chance to see the child go and provide with uh, uh, the family and etc and then you are uh, um, uh, welcome in the uh, uh, home of God because Baraka but um, actually the film is questioning and it is a political question that actually It, it, we have to deconstruct what is wrong in our countries that the people are going away. There is no equality, there is no chance, there is no education, there is no jobs. And this is why it is a political thing. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Usman. I want to go back to the rest of the panel now, and um, I'm going to skip to something that I had asked for at the end, but just in case we run out of time, I, I don't know if you three are playing with me or not, but I was wondering if you would each bring an idea of what is, what is a great documentary for you that has inspired you or that you would recommend to people. Is this still on your agenda? Does, does anyone want to speak to this? Um, Uh, I just, well, I haven't, I've skipped you, Cindy. I skipped your, your turn on this. Let me let you have this and then, then we'll come back. Yeah. Sure. Sorry um, about that. No, no worries. Um, no, I was just thinking that representation for me is a, an issue that's very related to the two other issues we've had in this conference, economy and democracy. And I think a lot of the language around the issue of representation often comes from the U.S. But I think it's important that we look at the economic systems we have in the US, the private money, and in Europe, the, the tax-based systems where we actually have ministries of culture and public service televisions, which are supposed to be uh, guided by policies and therefore can also be influenced by policies and therefore can, in theory at least, be pushed to be more equal in many different ways, both in terms of giving people access to a, a, a platform or to get support to make a film, even if you don't have private money yourself, and also for having more equal access for women and, and immigrants and uh, people with handicaps and disabilities and so on. But the problem with the tax-based system is also that it becomes very national. And I think that's part of what we are fighting in Denmark is the nationalism of 
the the whole approach and therefore when we do go in and make international productions in collaboration with people from syria or in zimbabwe or wherever we work it's also to bring in perspectives from other parts of the world into our society which is in my view in danger of sort of uh, closing in on itself and becoming very um yeah nationalistic and and uh, narrow-sighted i'm afraid very much very much thank you for that i think this is a, a problem in the world at this moment and i really take that to heart um very much so um uh do e do any of the three of you have a film you want to mention uh to our audience apart from your own that you have either found inspiring yourself or that you want to kind of give a push to to make it known to people does this question resonate at all does anyone have any answer to this yes very good thank you Nafisa, yes. Um, yeah, um, actually, I'm really honored to be together with Sigda because uh, uh, Act of Killing and Look of Silence have been very important films for me. And I always, uh, you know, see these films. Uh, I, I think Joshua, as a, as a filmmaker, he's amazing. He, he brings his uh, point of view in his films. Uh, actually, I was thinking to name these films, but yesterday I, uh, I, have, as I saw The Last Shelter and, uh, and I realized that, and I said to my cinematographer on the show, look, I mean, we really need to learn from this film because uh, I think it is so fascinating and I really hope that the uh, festival audience uh, sees Osman's film, The Last Shelter. Because uh, if I didn't know that it was Osman who uh, made the film, if, if I didn't know anything about the gender of the uh, um, director, I could have really guessed that it's a woman director because it is, you know, the film is very near, very sensual and all these things. And, you know, afterwards you can also think like, you know, what is gender? You know, we always, whenever we see things very near and tender and uh, slower, and uh, and full of empathy and we think that oh yeah this is this is you know woman's work but it was osman's work so <laughs> so i think you know it is a fabulous film and uh, it has the melancholy which i think it's really amazing and i i think the cinematography of the film and i said to my cinematographer Anders, i mean you have to see this film we i'm going to have yeah. lots of discussions with Anders after he sees the film. Wow. And I have really learned a lot about your uh, filmmaking, uh, uh, Osman, and I'm so thankful that you bring this film because yeah, usually you. these topics are very, uh, you know, they, they victimize the storytellers, but you, I don't know, it's you just, you know, bring them to us. And I, I was there, I felt that I was there with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Very Wonderful. Much. Thank you. No. Thank you, Nafisa, for that. And I, I agree with you. I think I think there is an intimacy to the camera work. You were the cinematographer, is that right, Usman, for your film? You shot it yourself? Yeah, there is yeah. an intimacy. There is an intimacy that we do not always see in documentary uh, of this kind, you know? And so I, I think I was really struck by that. Um, but the tenderness, you know, also, uh, Sine, in uh, Our Memory Belongs to Us, I was struck by the tenderness of these men toward each other. We don't always see masculinity shown in that way either. And so I think this is, in a way, a match to Usman's film in terms of Nefise's comments, that we see the, the tenderness and the grief of these men as they look at this old footage of their comrades who are dead. Um, how was it to capture that? I wonder. Extremely touching, and we were crying a lot, <laughs> um, even even when not understanding uh, everything that was going on because I don't speak Arabic. But uh, but it was a very touching time in that theater in Paris, or outside of Paris. I, I wanted to also answer your question about a film and a filmmaker who has been inspiring in this Thank way. You. And I want to mention Anand Patwadan, the Indian filmmaker, and he's also done amazing things uh, about masculinity. And one of his films, or a lot of his films are about 
Hindu nationalism and, and their discourse and deconstructing their discourses. There's, for example, Father, Son and Holy War, but he's made a, a bunch of films that I can recommend to, to as many people as possible. Yes, yes. Very good. Thank you. Um, is there any film that you want to mention, Usman, that has inspired you? I don't yeah. pas, film en fait. that uh, well, okay. can you hear check, now? Check. <laughs> oui, oui. Vas-y. Uh -huh. Okay, super. Uh, Est-ce qu'il y a okay. un film qui t'a inspiré, dont tu as envie de parler, un documentaire qui t'a particulièrement marqué et inspiré? Uh, pour ces films? Pour, pour les films que tu fais toi ou pour, pour ta vie uh, peut-être? Uh, je pense qu'en en fait, il uh, uh, il y, a, il y a beaucoup de films qui, qui m'ont inspiré euh, durant mon parcours, en fait, que ce soit quand j'étais à l'école euh, d'audiovisuel, à l'école de production et tout ça. Il y a surtout, en fait, euh, euh, des films qui, qui parlent, par exemple, euh, euh, Human. Human, c'est un film que j'aime beaucoup, Human, et qui est un film euh, qui parle euh, euh, des témoignages d'humains où on a toutes sortes de personnes qui viennent, qui parlent de, de ce qu'ils aiment. Ça part des choses les plus simples aux choses les plus euh, difficiles à expliquer. Et c'est un film que je regarde tout le temps parce que ça me touche. C'est un film euh, très humain. Et moi, j'aime beaucoup, en fait, euh, euh, quand on filme, en fait, euh, nos personnages avec humanité, en fait. Parce que je pense que euh, c'est ce qui est magnifique dans ce qu'on fait. Il ne faut pas, en fait... Euh, et animaliser les gens entre guillemets quand tu les filmes il faut les montrer avec plus de de voilà d'humanité mm -hmm. et ces films ça m'a beaucoup inspiré mm -hmm. il y a tu, aussi tu veux bien euh, euh, Magnet bah... Human Human yeah. est le... quel Human. est le directeur euh, c'est son nom que je suis en train Pour de chercher en fait Pardon, non c'est un directeur le... en fait il a fait au moins ça trois euh, coffrets, mais c'est un film qu'on trouve sur euh, okay, YouTube. Ok, on trouvera. C'est sure... un grand film. Yeah, I'm sure that the team on the chat is already searching uh, the name of this film, uh, Human. So you, yeah, uh, H-U-M-A-I-N is ça. in French. Yeah, okay, we will find it. We will put it ça. in the chat, I'm sure. Um, so I, I, I use this to translate in the meanwhile. So there are a couple voilà, of... C'est Yann, Yann, Yann Artus uh, Bertrand, en fait, qui l'a fait. Jan Artus Bertrand. Okay, so there are a couple of films ouais. which have been inspiring me since I was in school at cinema and production and uh, learning, but everything which has a specific uh, touch of humanity, which is actually avoiding to animalize people. You don't want to animalize people. You want to bring a lot of humanity in your films. Yeah. Et voilà, il y a beaucoup de films en tel que, uh, uh, par exemple, The Man Madness of Horizon de Peter Kruger également, qui m'a beaucoup, en fait, uh, inspiré uh, uh, dans le sens de la poésie, mais aussi de la cinématique, parce que c'est quelqu'un qui, qui sait comment, en fait, raconter des histoires rien qu'avec uh, l'image, et c'est hyper poétique ce qu'il fait. Et moi, j'aime beaucoup travailler avec tout ce qui est abstrait, qui, voilà, tout ce qui est décousu, en fait, j'aime pas les histoires euh, linéaires, en fait, j'aime euh, plonger euh, des choses qui, qui semblent euh, vraisemblables, souvent tu regardes, euh, et pouf, il y a des séquences qui arrivent, euh, qui te percutent, qui te font réfléchir, et lui, euh, Peter Kruger, ses films m'ont, euh, voilà, euh, beaucoup enrichi en termes de poésie, de l'image, et, et comment raconter une histoire sans la parole, en fait. Il y a aussi les films de Yes. So I have to hurry up. So uh, yes, so it's the films of Peter Kruger that I can also I highly recommend uh, because they tell the stories just with the picture. And I like this, that this is so poetic, that the, the picture alone uh, uh, is enough. I love also the fact that it is not linear stories. I don't like linear stories. I like when it is actually a little bit... Um, Yes, I don't know the name for Décousu, yeah. <laughs> but you understand yeah. what I mean, non-linear. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Bon. Yeah. Bon. 
Thank you both. Um, and I am going to take the opportunity as moderator to just recommend in the festival um, uh, the film by Rintu Thomas and Shushmit Ghosh, Writing with Fire from India, that I think is an exceptional film. I know they're speaking later today. And I will just add, before we run out of our presentation time, that um, I was teaching in social documentary program, and I had a kind of motto for the students that came out of there, which was that every film you make has to not just communicate to the world, but it must be legible to the people who are in it. It must be legible to the people on the other side of the camera from you so that they recognize themselves when they see themselves on screen. And I think this is one point that I would make and in my capacity as moderator to add in as an extra point. And also to say that I am so happy to be doing this session with all of you today and our, our one minute left before the chat. Um, on a on a year when the I'm, I should just say I'm honored to be a member of the Academy Documentary Branch. However, for in this time of 2021, this time with so many crucial issues, for the award to go to my octopus teacher, I think is just a very sad state of affairs. So I think as documentarians, you all have a lot of work to do so that all together we communicate to audiences and filmmakers and other disciplines and uh, to the public and to the critics what constitutes really a true documentary, a documentary like the ones that the three of you have made, such beautiful documentaries that communicate truth, communicate authenticity, bring such important issues to the public, help people to think outside of their own experience, help people to think about the world in which we find ourselves today that so many of us are so ill-prepared to uh, cope with. So I had, I just want to kind of give my own version of inspiration at the end. And I believe if, if my timer is telling the truth, that we now have a little bit of time to hear from audience. Is that right, AC? This is right, but I think you. I think they have been fascinatingly uh, listening to this session because I don't see any. I don't see any Q and A's coming up. I don't know if you have any uh, Q and A's, Ruby. This is wonderful. So I would say maybe we can um, maybe we can uh, add another question, Ruby, if you would like to have a last round with uh, yes. every speaker. Yes, I would love to. Um, that's very good. Um, so. We have been speeding you through this, and I know that I had asked everyone to think about what was the most important issue to bring forward. So are there points we have not touched on yet um, that any of you have prepared to communicate? Because this is such a precious time in terms of our audience, in terms of this opportunity. Um, other points you would like to make? Yes? No? Senior? Yes? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's very important that we talk about uh, filmmaking as collaboration also. And I know, of course, it, you have a lot of power when you are behind the camera, but it's also very much to do with how you are behind the camera and how you are uh, communicating and, and working with the people in front of the camera, not just while you make the film, but also beforehand to prepare and afterwards to finish the film and get it out there. And I, I really liked your comment about that it must be legible to those who are in front of the screen. But also, I think there is a lot of, of collaboration that happens in the aftermath and, and in the use of the film. And hopefully the kind of films we are making have that in mind and have a long term uh, outreach and impact uh, ambition as well as an ambition to do a fair representation and and uh, and to focus on the important issues. Wonderful, thank you for that, Signe. I know we hear a lot of talk about co-creation now, but I'm not always sure what the reality is. So this is very good to have flagged by you as something to consider. Um, Nefise, do you want to add to that? Yes, I think like um, now all around the world we are uh, dealing with the issues uh, like uh, uh, terrorism and extremism 
and uh, and I think this uh, extremism is not just you know coming from it's not a you know uh, a gift of God. I mean it it has it is patterns, and it is based on this. Uh, Exclusion. I mean, the exclusion is a really uh, very uh, invisible process. And I think lots of uh, second, third generation immigrants living in Europe uh, have been feeling this exclusion from the society. They are not good enough. And I am an immigrant uh, woman uh, filmmaker and I'm, you know, whatever I do, uh, I mean, I'm interested in gender and Islam and religion or uh, whatever. So whatever I do, it will be a niche and yalla yalla kind of a filmmaker. So I just wonder when am I going to be, you know, one part of the mainstream. So, uh, so it's just, you know, you just always feel yourself like you belong to the niche. Yeah, and and the niche, in fact, for some of us is the most important world. So we have to find a way to turn that around, I think. Thank you for that. So Usman, what about you? Oh, sorry, Nafisa, go ahead. So when I, I was just uh, saying that when gender is a niche, so what is not a niche? <laughs> so I just wonder. Thank you. Thank you. Usman, what about you? Euh, tu... Je pense que en fait c'est c'est je c'est hyper important en fait euh, euh, la relation qui la relation entre euh, le filmeur et le filmé en fait parce que ce qui fait la ce qui est intéressant selon moi dans le documentaire c'est que c'est déjà c'est d'abord une relation humaine en fait qui qui est qui s'installe obligatoirement quand on fait euh, un film documentaire en fait parce que quand tu filmes quelqu'un pendant un mois, deux mois, trois mois, ce n'est plus un personnage, un réalisateur en fait. Ça des... Soit il y a une vraie amitié qui se crée, il y a une familiarité qui se crée, mais il y a quelque chose d'humain qui se crée en fait, qui continue même après le film en fait. C'est pourquoi euh, euh, la majorité en fait des films qui, qui passent euh, où on a l'impression que c'est vraiment du réel, c'est qu'il y a eu un réel travail derrière en fait, c'est-à-dire euh, un réel travail de repérage, un réel travail euh, pour comprendre en fait euh, euh, la personnalité du personnage, pour que le personnage aussi comprenne euh, ce qu'on veut faire et cela euh, aboutit forcément après et le film à une, une relation euh, ne serait-ce que humaine en fait, c'est ce qui est aussi euh, voilà, nous donne envie de faire le documentaire parce que à la fin, on se retrouve euh, et, et voilà, voir euh, cette relation qui reste même après le film, en fait. Yeah. Ok. Yes. So the most Thank important you. thing yes, here is actually the relation between the filmmaker and the protagonist. It must be a humane relation because after two months, three months, and etc., there is somehow a true familiarity which is getting into the picture or a true friendship at, at any case humanity and after the film and beyond the film this is going to stay and this is what is real this is sure that there has been a real work so that the protagonists also understand what is happening and at the end you will find each other again after the film very good beautiful ac i understand you have a question for us do you want to just read that in the few minutes we have left? Oh, yes. Um, I'm told there is a question. Yes, there is a question. Yes, absolutely. Sorry, I'm, I'm <laughs> between my notes. I'm the host. I'm the curator. Yes, I'm the translator. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> it's all right. Okay. So I definitely agree with the fact that the documentary has to be legible for the people who are in it. But I would like to ask, how do you deal with difficult, controversial characters who, for example, are hiding something in front of the camera or want to represent a certain opinion but might not tell the real truth? And it is a question of Monica Grassi. Who would like to take the question? Oh, because we that's have a one minute question left. Yeah, it's I, a very hard one. We have one minute. I'm afraid the question does not have time to be answered. But I, I think that none this, I mean, I think that probably the best answer would come uh, from you, Signe, in terms of the act of killing. There is the example of the people, you know, some had something to hide, some had nothing to hide, and they should have. Um, 
I, yeah, I don't no, know I, if I, the I'm others, sorry, I the mean... The question goes yes. to Nefise. I'm sorry to say, the question goes to Nefise as uh, Seren Ate Atesh sometimes is seen as controversial. I'm sorry, I have to redirect to gain time. <laughs> ah, okay. yes, well, we have 20, 29 seconds, so... I, I okay. give you one minute. I, I may do that. <laughs> Uh, yes, in the film uh, we have uh, uh, we have uh, uh, filmed in a brothel in in uh, Berlin, and the sex workers they didn't want to uh, be visible in the film. But we have we have uh, recorded their voices, and then uh, we have uh, 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 because it was very important that they shouldn't be recognizable. So we have uh, youth and reenactment. And at the same time in China, when Seiran Atesh met uh, LGBT circles, uh, so some of the people in the circle, they didn't want to be visible, uh, but they wanted that their stories will come uh, in this film. So, mm -hmm. uh, so I always contact with the uh, storytellers. And uh, so, uh, so in that sense, I mean, it's, it is very important that they, I mean, nobody recognizes uh, them, especially the contract that I have done with the sex workers. Very good. Thank you for that. Thank you, everyone. Uh, this has been a terrific session. Um, it's been wonderful to meet all of you. Thank you for having us, AC, and good luck with the rest of the conference. I'll, I'll be attending. Thank you, and thank, thank you to you. all of you. This was wonderful. I, I, ah, I was just there to translate, but I'm a fan of all of you, I have to say. So <laughs> all of you. Well, otherwise, yes, you know, yeah, I wouldn't have invited you. <laughs> oui, bien sûr. À bientôt, Usman. So thank you so much. Sure. Stay tuned. We're going to go on with the AMA sessions. See you in a sec. Thank you very much.